All right, welcome to another episode of New Wine Uncorked, and we're stoked that you're joining us this Friday again uh, to talk, to discuss, to, to just a dialogue about life and the things, the happenings that are going on around us. And uh, this week again, uh, Pastor Jim is joining us, which is an exciting thing because when we're talking, we're continuing our talk about the Gospels, and New Wine Uncorked is about uncorking, uh, stepping into the possibilities. Uh, a theologian back in the mid 1900s, uh, uh, you know, talked about the impossible possibility. The Gospels are meant to bring in this reality that really is showing us what the truth of what it means to be uh, today in society. But as if you've lived you know, any kind of years within adulthood, you know that there are many forces that are pressing into who am I? Who am I as a person? Identity, uh, and especially too today with the Olympics, which is exciting part. We get to see these athletes and uh, performances. Some of the, the sports, like uh, my family and I got a chance to watch uh, handball <laughs> of all sports. Like it is a crazy sport, right? And so the Olympics are this, uh, we see these athletes doing some of the, the, the highest number, uh, uh, level of, of athletics, right? What about the church though, in the highest level of evangelism or the highest level of love? We don't talk a lot about hierarchy of action. Like, are there levels of actions that we do where one action is more important than the other? Uh, within Christianity, uh, there's, tends to be a push to, to, to root out any kind of leveling, you know, this hierarchical, something better than another. But the reality is, is there are some things that are more beneficial, some things that are more uh, effective in procuring an outcome and a result. Well, what is the result of the gospel message? What is the hope for outcome uh, for churches in the 21st century? And a lot of things are going on over these last few years. And so today we're continuing the discussion on the gospels, the goodness of the gospel. Today, have we been become vaccinated from it or are we victorious in it? You know, does it even affect us? And if not, though, does that mean that the church, so those of us who have had roles within leadership of the church or even participants in the church, does that mean that maybe we're off our rockers? You know, if more people seem to be unfazed uh, in, in some sense, vaccinated by the goodness of the gospel message, does that mean that the church then is off base or are we just uh, missing the mark? Um, and so that's what we're continuing today. And so it's a big week. I don't know if the two of you are at all into Olympics and things like this, but I feel like for the church, every like weekend, every year is an Olympic year where people are waiting for big things to see. And it seems like, you know, I look around the internet and the big things from the church are just scandal and abuse and abuse of power. And so it's no wonder that people question, they, when they hear us say, oh, what's so good about the good news? They, they nod their head and say, yeah, what do you mean by the good news? I hear the gospels are good news, but for what? I don't know what your, your take is, you know, 21st century here, we're, we're new month in a couple of days. Are, am I off or is there is there a lacking of goodness from the gospel message in the 21st century today? Yeah. I wouldn't probably use the word vaccinated to the <laughs> gospel, but I would use the word inoculated to the gospel. Okay. Because All right. All right. In, in America, most of us have been to some level or whatnot. We've been exposed to church and somehow or another, and even have at least enough in the back of our minds that we can create stereotypes, no matter how distant or near we are to the church. And so, yeah, when someone comes and brings the gospel to you and say, hey, you know, I have some good news. All right, man, what, what you trying to sell? <laughs> All right. There's some type of buildup as to what they're expecting and what they what they expect to hear or it's even even worse where they've been hurt by Christians in the past. So there's been some exposure from most people to the gospel. So so it does make it in a way that it's kind of good news to us, but we have to work hard to make it good news to others. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and, and I agree, Philip. And the question is, is how do you do that, right? I mean, is it only done with words? Is it done with language? Or, you know, or is it, um, you know, the whole idea of what, um, you know, orthopraxy, right? Practicing, right. Pra living it out, you know, living it out. And so I heard an auntie say one time when the missionaries came to Hawaii, they, I mean, they love to hear about Jesus. I mean, they love the gospel. Um, it broke down, but she, her comment was, you know, if they would have lived like Jesus, it would have gone a whole lot better. 
Yeah. Well, and so do you think, uh, could I hear this? So I'm, I'm curious because I was thinking about this when people talk about, you know, fulfillment, God's fulfillment of promises and this, they always point back to the Old Testament. And then they point to just the first few years of like Jesus's life, let's say for the fulfillment of the promises. What about those fulfilled promises in the 21st century? Because I like, I agree with you in the, the and I know the wording is, is uh, uh, somewhat contentious talking about vaccinations and talking about inoculation and all this stuff with the gospel message, because in some sense, the gospel message is supposed to be that thing that inoculates us from fear, uh, from uh, judgment of one another, from, from whatever we see as being uh, contentious with the person in front of me. That's the gospel message, I would think, because it's uh, supposed to be rooted in love. Does the church, though, understand that? You know, so Phil, I take your point. Ooh, I want to say, because it is, it's like when we're talking vaccinations, we're talking inoculation, we're talking medical terms with today, you know, the culture that's being set up between at one point it was mask versus no mask. Now it's becoming vaccination versus non-vaccination. Does the church though do that in some sense where if you don't reach a level of piety, depending on the leadership of that church, then you are not the in crowd, you know, so whatever the in crowd is nowadays, vaccinated or non-vaccinated, masked or non-masked, you know, does the church set up that uh, bifurcated us versus them, even amidst our message of love and inclusion? And it's pretty tragic though as well that um, within the church, there's often ways that we find to separate ourselves. I mean, we've seen it over the past couple of years where we can put someone, we either label them, we can find a way to label them a bad guy, a heretic, uh, uh, someone who's just not preaching the gospel appropriately. We find reasons to do that. So it definitely is a thing um, where we do separate an us versus them. And, and again, I always I like bringing up Tony in this because we create problems <laughs> only we can solve. And so, yeah, we turn into, it, 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 in our niche group of Christians, we then create divisions within that niche group of Christians to point at other Christians and say how horrible they are. Um, when in all actuality, we have our own, wherever, wherever perspective you're at, you have your own things going on within your perspective. And within your movement, you have your own troubles, you have your own problems. And um, those things just need to be rooted out as well as anyone else's. And we're only degrees apart from anyone else when it's talking theologically or how we function church-wise, all the above. And so there is things where we, where we do divide ourselves. And the, the joy, I mean, not the joy, but the challenge is how do we cross those lines? How do we accept those things that aren't central to the message of the gospel and say, all right, yo, brother, we can figure the rest of this out. Um, yeah. I bring up, uh, I was reading a book a little while ago. I forget what it's called now, but one of the arguments <laughs> in the book was um, talking about um, the LGBTQ plus community and how there's so many differences between each one of those movements, but still in all public front, they seem to be united. Pride Parade, you don't know which one, well, you kind of know which one you're bumping into, but <laughs> Pride Parade, they're all there. How come the church can't do something like that? There's a yeah. message for the church where we can say, you believe in Jesus, we're good, we can figure the rest of this out. So. Yeah, and what do you think that is? What do you think that holds us back from the church? Because I do watch some of these movements. This is where, um, you know, when you talk about truth and sometimes within the church, you say all truth is God's truth, people will recoil and say, woo, careful. And I know uh, back in the fourth century with uh, uh, Augustine, uh, he had the saying, you know, love God and live as you want. And a lot of people from the church were like, oh no, we can't tell people to live how they want because even if we tell them to love God, they're going to choose the flesh. And so there's always this uh, bifurcation between living according to the flesh and living according to the spirit. And I find it interesting, um, you know, because when we talk about unity, the first unity like that you start uh, that reading through the New Testament was the unity between the ones that were labeled as uncircumcised and then the, the ones who are labeling them who had labeled themselves circumcised, you know, so it, again, it's a power structure. And what does Jesus do in Ephesians? Paul writes that Christ came to break down, not just to remove the dividing wall, but to destroy it, you know, to break it down. And yet today, I, I wonder, though, and, and I think I'm guilty of this, too, is when trying to uh, break down these walls, inadvertently creating other walls, you know, so I say, oh, we're inclusive. 
uh, LGBTQ, um, you know, and we're inclusive of people who uh, think this way when it comes to evolution. You know, we're inclusive of people who believe in the Big Bang Theory. We're inclusive of folks who believe that, you know, whatever the case might be. But in saying that we're inclusive, again, goes back to that kind of stuff that you were talking about a few weeks ago, uh, Jim, with the doctrine of discovery that, hey, you can join our group. Absolutely. We em embrace you. However, once you get in, then there are these different uh, details that you have to start to follow and, and, and mold into or else you'll be ostracized. So in, in that level of like inclusion, though, isn't the church perpetuating by our actions division, whereas our words are saying we want unity. Hmm. You know, I, yeah, yeah. You know, I think, you know, to hear the gospel, I mean, the gospel is good news, right? I mean, the presentation of the God, I mean, you know, I'll be honest. I mean, there's a lot of issues, you know, as far as the gospel and how it's affected other, you know, other cultures and things like that. You know, when I heard the gospel, it was good news. I mean, I'm like, I want in. Um, I was, a, you know, and, and kind of my, my context was young life. And so, you know, but it's like, I heard the gospel, I want in. But the problem, I think problem down the road is all of a sudden it's like, and I think this is what maybe what you're alluding to is the fine print. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't see this. Fine. Oh, so this is what it, oh, I have to do this also. Right. But when you see the gospel, you hear the gospel, but you know, uh, love and sacrifice of Jesus and you know, all these things you're like, I'm in, but it's the fine print. It, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. You need to do this or you need to do that. And even like, you know, terms like being inclusive and all that. I mean, it's almost like you're having to give up your identity or giving up something of yourself. Right. I mean, I, and I don't see there, if there's anything wrong, about um, you know holding holding fast our views right I mean I think we all have you know we look at the scripture the scripture is living but we're not all going to agree with the scriptures but are we willing to live in the tension um, mm. of of that without you know without having people to call names and say oh you're this or you're that because you don't believe what I believe you know you know the other thing too really quick is um, Matt you brought up about this hierarchy you know yeah. the hierarchy of you know this and so um talk you know and thinking about the olympics right i mean the whole idea of the olympics is you bring in the best of the best you bring in the best athletes you you bring in the people that are going to win and maybe they're you know and there, i think there's that expectation in the church everybody's going to win and when you mess up when you know when you can't reach that you're like you, you failed right i mean you're feeling you know people are like oh man but you know what i think this olympics um simone biles what an example. I mean, everybody's this expectation of coming in and being your best. And she finally just says, you know what? I'm struggling. You know, I mean, personally, and, and you know, I mean, she just says, I realize I need to take care of myself. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure there's some people like, well, how dare she come and steal a spot from somebody else? Or she's supposed to be a professional and all this. But you know what? I mean, that's real life, <laughs> you know? And so in this world of perfection, in this world of doing it all right, and, you know, the idea of being holy is not the idea of being perfect. Um, you know, the good news is that the good news is Jesus is with us. I mean, he continues to walk with us in all situations. And so, you know, maybe the, the idea about, you know, the, the gospel is good news is that, you know, it, it's it's good, but it's not perfect. It's not we're all happy. You know, it's not like we don't have problems. Yeah, and still with that, um, thinking of the, the good news is the fact that you're not perfect and you know you're not perfect and you're accepting the fact that you're not perfect and that you need help and that you're reaching out to Jesus for that help. You're reaching out to a community within the church for that help. And I think that the reality, that reality is what makes us have the part of, at least part of the reason why we have our divisions is that most, some of, many of us don't want to accept the fact that we do need help that mm -hmm. we fall short in many ways, that things confuse us and that, we're, and that we don't know what to do. And then we latch onto something, we latch onto a phrase in the text, in context or out of context, whatever, we latch onto something in the text and we build an entire movement on it and it ends up being a thing that hurts people. It ends up being a thing that creates more division and creates more pain when we're really just trying to live into the gospel, but we're trying to bring into the gospel our hurts and the like and not live into the full power of the Holy Spirit, so. Yeah, we're afraid of getting like, if we, we don't get a nine, if we get like a 7.3 on something, man, we're like freaking out. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so true. It's so, and that's where it's like, isn't that the tension? Because I dig the Olympics. Like uh, uh, back in the day, you know, some 
when I was young and I could move like, you know, in my, after college and stuff, there was a couple of guys from my wrestling team when we, we did the, uh, train for the Olympic trials. And it was, I mean, the level of competition that, that I got to just be involved in, and it was amazing. But there was a point where it was life consuming. You know, uh, my wife and I were um, we just had our, our first uh, child when I was started to, the trials and stuff and uh, training for it. And it's a lifestyle. And so I, I agree with you, uh, Jim, in the sense that it's cool when you see um, an athlete like pause. <laughs> There's a tension there, though, right? Because do, do you think, though, on a daily basis that the rest of us, though, have those same kind of tensions though that we don't and then that because we're not doing olympic size events then our depression or our doubts or anything aren't as um profound they're not as viable they're not as real and so people so i i wonder too like with some of the the backlashes people are like well that's great that you can step aside from but what about me and i wonder if that's the the absence of the church you know is that while I agree with you, it, the God, there's something good about the gospels. And sometimes you can't even, uh, there's this song uh, that Lil Wayne has, I think it's run in or paradise or something. What one of the lyrics he says is I can't tell you, but I can show you, you know? And so it's like, you have to show love. Um, and it's not about doing, yeah. but in showing love, you show it both in word and deed. And I just wonder sometimes though, when we talk about the good news, I believe it, you believe it, Phil, you believe it. We, I know because our lives have been radically altered since that moment. And we've made more and more decisions to go further into what the goodness is calling us into. It's not about a message. It's about a person, you know, yeah. and that person, Jesus then steps into us and says, actually, you are a person, you know, and, I, and so I, I dig the Olympics. I like the level of it, but sometimes I wonder though, if it then stretches us and causes us because then we're saying, Oh, to be the best, you have to be on the podium, right? Yeah. Like some of the uh, uh, argument that I got, I, I was reading, you know, online is just gnarly when you start reading people like, but <laughs> from the, uh, I don't know if you remember the athlete um, from the trials who she, um, I think she smoked marijuana and then got disqualified. And there were people like going off on like, well, look, you, you know what you're, you're getting into. I mean, come on, you're trying for the Olympics and they don't understand that the, the, the gravity of everything involved, you know? And so then we, we elevate these poor athletes and no matter what, they can never live up to the standard because like you're saying within the church, even though we might say it, you're not going to need to be perfect. We take that be perfect as your father and heaven is perfect. And we say, Oh, well, perfection without understanding this, but see the human perfection is different in the sense of Jesus allows that perfection to be a process where our perfection really starts within the heart, right? Yeah. He wants us to perfect that love, like, uh, and it's an acceptance. And I don't know how many Christians skip that phrase, the, 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 the process of love of self, you know, because we, we talk so much about selfishness and narcissism and the Olympics, it does sort of bring that up because it's all about, you know, the winner and the second place is, you know, the first loser is what we used to say, like <laughs> such not loving language we have in, in sports as a coach. Some of the things I said, I'm like, ah, <laughs> but with that push towards excellent though, how do you then tell people or show people within the church? Actually, we want to push the excellence of love where yes, we want excellence in our actions, whether it's sports or education or business, but ultimately it has to be rooted in love. How do we teach people that when I myself struggle with what it means to love myself, you know, in, in a, in a, in a righteous way? Yeah. Oh man. So many answers with that one. Um, <laughs> That's why I come to YouTube, you know, every Friday, it's my, my session. I just sit here. I feel like I should be laying down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I have not really answered responses. Um, but I think being honest about that tension, Jim brought up earlier, living in the tension Understanding, yeah, there's there's stuff that that stuff that we're wrestling with that we're still learning how to do, but we understand part of the call is to love. Part of the call is to be there for people. Part of the call is to show through our actions that the Holy Spirit is living and active in our lives. Um, but being aware of the tensions that we have, but still not using those things as excuses not to love. It, be, it becomes a thing. Um, that becomes a thing. But also, um, 
we we have a we have a um within the church we have our own celebrity culture we have our own rock star culture we have our own <laughs> put the best on the podium and rank them one two and three and um sometimes grabbing the four five and six and saying all right you're gonna take the role of one two and three or the one two and three taking a step down saying oh i'm gonna use the 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 privilege i've been given through being one two and three to promote um, numbers 199 and 98, <laughs> you know, and you and share and using that way um, and promoting things that way. There, there's there's ways we can do it, but I think we live into so much of the celebrity culture that is it's very difficult to not think that you always have the right answers, especially when people are coming to you looking for answers on issues that that you have answers to or not, and you have to have something to say. And it's like, nah, you, you don't have to have something to say. Just say, I, I don't know. This one I'm, I'm still wrestling with. Here's my tension that I'm living in between. But I don't know. I'm sitting with the same confusion you're in. Let's seek the Holy Spirit on this and, and roll with, with what we feel the Holy Spirit is saying here. So, yeah. You know, the, the other part of like the whole Olympic story, right, is that, you know, you talk about that we have the podiums, the one, two, and the three. But you know what, though? I mean, some of the stories, some of the best stories aren't the winner stories, right? But it's the stories about the people that, um, you know, I mean, I remember stories about the guy that ran the marathon and he finished last and there was only, you know, half the people in the stadium and it was after dark. But I mean, this guy's just struggling over the line and people are just cheering him on. And, you know, and and those are the type of stories, you know, we share as um, illustrations. Right. I mean, those are like the sermon illustrations. But, you know, maybe it's and, and you know, we wouldn't have known about that story, but there was somebody that was running a camera. There was somebody there that, that thought enough to say, you know what? this this is significant and they and they point that out because we would never hear the story and maybe the answer or i don't know what the answer is but maybe what would help is that you know there i agree there is such a celebrity you know right the celebrity and i think sometimes we've uh, leading in ministry in, in the areas we're in we're there's a celebrityism i mean there, we're looked at celebrities and we don't want that right but i mean i think maybe it's being the person that points out the stories that are behind the scene there's a woman in our church i mean she just um, and I don't say, oh yeah, she's always struggling financially, but she don't, she, she just does what she does, but she always is able to gift kids. She just, you know, and so being able to point those stories out saying, you know what, generosity isn't just necessarily how much you have, you know, and spending a lot, but you know, Diane, Diane is, has a, a way of just blessing kids with these, with these significant gifts, you know, and she'll go to like Dollar Tree or whatever, <laughs> but maybe it's pointing out, you know, the story, um, that's sitting among the congregation. It's the stories that maybe, I mean, it, maybe it's just listening better, um, but I think it's pointing out those type of heroic stories that people are like, and then, you know, you know, then people are like, oh, I like that. But I think what makes these stories so awesome, it's like, you know what? I'm the guy that's gonna be coming in last place. I, I am the guy that I hope somebody will leave the light on so I can at least see where the finish line is. And so there's something that resonates. And, you know, we talk about gospel, and, you know, just being what this incredible, you know, pietistic Christian, right? But really, we're the people that are coming in last place. And we just want to know, oh, man, I, you know, I can gain, you know, um, inspiration from that. And so. And yeah, all of us can. And, and the interesting <laughs> thing that 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 bring up with yours is, um, is the fact that you can name people in your church that has those kind of stories. Yeah. <laughs> see, <laughs> Phil, you can see, Phil, you've got like the breath, you could say, Matt was a wrestler and that guy, he is on the podium. Right. And my right. buddy, Jim Sakara, who, I mean, he likes to eat spam and <laughs> be, and yes, man, yeah. he's like going, he loves these all you can eat places. He's like running a marathon, but the dude, he's coming in three days later, but you know what? He <laughs> finished. <laughs> That's, it. That's it. But the fact that, that we can breaking down the celebrity culture in a way that allows your pastor just to wander through the church and know people within the congregation. Jim, you do it. I'm thinking of, um, I'm thinking of um, Tom Shive, another one. I seen him wander around. I saw him wander around a woman's retreat. Well, we were having a new wines retreat and then they were having, at the same location, they were having, I believe a woman's retreat at the same location. And I remember watching Tom Shive work a table, just walk <laughs> around the table, shaking hands with every woman from his church that was at the table, but asking detailed questions. <laughs> to each person at the table. And they were like, there had to be over 20 people there. And each, it took forever, but he's walking to each of them, detailed questions, shaking hands. How's your grandchildren doing? I, I remember that, it, and, oh, oh man, stuff like that. We gotta get back, there's some, there's some stuff we have to get back to that. 
where you're able to connect with the people in your church. And I mean, it's not just on the congregation to be able to do it. And maybe not every pastor can do it, understood. But there's something where we got to get back to, you know, your people. And so, you know, those stories, that's not the best story, but we know the people that are struggling. We understand that our lives are lived like that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Matt, we were talking about living um, life from the perspective of the cross, being a cross people. And, um, and that becomes part of the story. Like we experience this. We don't always have the best stories. No, but we have stories of people struggling. And then we have the testimony of God being with us in the middle of that struggle. And we can clearly know that it's God's presence that's there. And so it's not always the winners that show that this is God with us. No, God is with us all the time, every space we're in. Yeah. So, Yeah, isn't it? It's weird um, because I think with the Olympics, I dig this story. It's like uh, the weightlifter from the Philippines and it's the first, you know, gold medal. And like the first I was watching a, um, a woman from, I think it was like the country had you know, like 200,000 yeah. and it was their first gold medal for shooting or something like yeah. this, like this obscure sport where I'm just like, Oh, wow. But it was really neat. Uh, uh, and, and going back to the, uh, uh, I think she was a hammer thrower or some that she got third place and then she uh, got disqualified for the marijuana. And some of the things I was reading though is, Oh, but she was only third place, you know? So of course it's third place and she's trying to make a big, is if it wasn't good enough because she wasn't the top and yet, <laughs> There are how many other people that she beat out to be like, I know, like going to the trials and stuff, they only invite like the top so many, but only the top two, you know, in some sports, you got the, the main person and the alternate. And so even with Simone Biles, like I agree with you, Jim, it's neat. I think it's great that she had the courage to do it. I just find it fascinating and, and just tragic how people, yes, there possibly was a spot that she took from someone. Why look at the negative? How about that she actually is helping others who then didn't get thrown into that spot, who felt like, oh my gosh, if Simone Biles steps away, then I have to come in here regardless of what I'm feeling and I have to score, like how much you know, pressure. And so it, it, I hear what you're saying as far as like, you know, we need to get away from the celebrity status. I wonder though, like even with the Olympics where it used to be all just amateurs, right? Now we have professionals and this kind of thing and people, you know, but as, as much as the Olympics are trying to uh, be this unifying thing for the nations, doesn't it just perpetuate what we do even within our churches is we, we say we want to get rid of the celebrity status, but all the while we're always looking to the left and to the right to see what are they doing? Are we just at least one step ahead of them? you know and then we over spiritualize things oh look at well they're doing this but guess what we're doing this prayer thing and so we're lashing ourselves one more lash and doing one more hour prayer so we're more mm. pietistic and so we have our own kind of olympics going on you know within the churches yeah how silly is that like <laughs> we're using prayer as a way to say i'm better or worse than you i don't an example but how silly is that oh man yeah. We find reasons. We find reasons to divide ourselves and not find reasons to come together, to pray for one another, to understand that we're all struggling in the middle of this crazy world that we're in. Yeah. Uh, it's, it just it does baffle me. There's the more and more I think about it that just that we don't find reasons to come together. We find reasons to separate ourselves. We got a, we have a million denominations in our country. I mean, I don't know if there's a, there's probably more than a million. It's just, there's just so many independent. Everyone wants to. Uh, I'll stop. I'm going to say something really yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, but, you know, the other thing, too, you know, about Simone Biles is when she steps up, you know, you know, we, we look and focus on her stepping away. Right. But you know what? There is an alternative person. I mean, the, the, the Olympics has somebody kind of, you know, they bring people along just in case situations, whether it be injuries or things like that. But you know what? Now this this individual has an opportunity to be able to share her gift in front of, you know, in on a stage. And, I, you know, it's not and I'm not focusing on the performance, but think of this individual that, you know, they're like. Oh yeah, you're the alternative, right? Or you're the alternate. And so they, but they practice just as hard. They put as much time, as much effort. And so they're, oh yeah, you're the alternative or, you know, the alternate, alternate, alternate. But then all of a sudden, you know, for whatever reason, Simone Biles decides to step aside. And this person is put in this position to where I get to show what I've been working hard at. And I, you know, and I wonder if in the church that we do that is that we, we, we give such a high elevation about how we, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. 
There's times where I feel inadequate when it comes to prayer and I don't want to follow somebody. I would rather not pray. Um, but you know, when, when people are given that opportunity or maybe when that celebrity is off the stage, it opens the doors for people that have a gift, the people that have been you know, exercising their, or using their gift, but haven't had that opportunity within the body, right? It's not about the performance, but it's being able to share with everybody, you know, that gift. And so, um, and maybe that, you know, celebrity status is that we make people feel like, you know what, this is what you have to do, or this, you know, a prayer group or add this or that, instead of allowing people to, you know what, it's cool to be, you know, I mean, giving the, the people that, al that are alternates in life, the chance to come forward and be, and allow to be what God has called them to be, not what the world has, where the world has placed them. Yeah. I mean, and I, th I believe that Simone started as an alternate her in her own Olympics uh, uh, career as well. So it is interesting. And, and it, it's the language, right? The language is, is that, yes, there are alternates. I mean, that's what uh, Paul highlights in Ephesians, that the uncircumcised in some sense were the alternates that then, but it's not as if they're replacing anyone, right? Like the alternate is able to come alongside the person who was slated to be in that position. And this is the truth of the church I think is so often lost is we're not seeing it. We see like, some are going to see what happened with Simone is, is, um, as a negative, as if she lost out or whatever, as opposed to seeing it as a positive aspect of really coming into understanding who she is. And we should be embracing this and then embracing the fact that, dude, because you're willing to reach out and, and allow us to step into your hurt, right? I mean, it, that's, that's sometimes I think we forget that when someone is being vulnerable and they're willing to be authentic with who they are, that there's a gift to us because they're opening themselves up and they're actually, you know what, and I don't know where she is with the faith or any of the, the gymnasts, but this is the Christian like truth is that you're supposed to become less, you know, so, so by, by her stepping forward and saying, I actually am in need, she's acknowledging where she has to become less of her, you know, less, less me and more of Jesus, where there's like, a, a, a creating space within ourselves so as to receive, mm -hmm. you know, your help, your wisdom, your whatever you're going to do, if, if it's nothing more than to receive your presence, you know, and so I wonder sometimes too, if in all of this, a lot of people understand where Simone is, like, <laughs> I, I would imagine that 99% of us go, when we first hear it, our things are Oh, totally. And then we get selfish and say, gosh, it would be nice if I could do that. Right. Like that selfishness kicks in. It's so interesting. <laughs> um, if you go through like this idea of self-reference, right? Like we become the self so that no matter what, and, and so that's where I'm saying is like, I sometimes wonder though, so vaccination is supposed to keep you from getting uh, 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 the virus or, or something from a, a virus, right? So that's why I use that word because sometimes we use the gospel though to vaccinate ourselves from the, 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 the bacteria or whatever that we see from society, right? Instead of like you were talking about Phil with the cross, stepping into the victory of the cross that says, what does Jesus say? Don't worry about this society. Don't worry about, they can't hurt you. It's the one who can take your soul, the one who can keep you, you know, that makes you did really believe that there is no God, you know, to go with Nietzsche and say, God is dead to actually go, Oh yeah. You know what? I think God is dead. Like I can be my own God. Right. <laughs> so that's where I, I wonder if, do we vaccinate ourselves from, because stepping into relationship sometimes is tough. Well, all the time being in relationship with each other, because I know I'm not, I'm not, you know, a, 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 a peach cobbler that's sweet all the time, you know, like I, I can have some, some tartness to me and some bitterness that when you, when we all hang out, you're like, dude, seriously, and I'm supposed to love you, right? Like, so like, I, I wonder though, if with the church, we're just not even honest with ourselves. Like I love relationality. I love my, my marriage, my wife, my kids, but sometimes guess what? They're irritating. And so am I. So how do we deal with that authenticity without being, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of like so selfish though, where, you know, how, when people, they, they, they use humility, but it's really just pointing back to themselves and trying, you know, Oh, but I'm so good. Yeah. So how do we get into that realness? Yeah. 
but the example we've been using Simone Biles this whole time is, is kind of it where uh, just be honest about where you are mm. be honest uh, you know I was listening to um oh man um um Dale Dale Jr mm -hmm. oh is that the racer um lost mm -hmm. his, his father yeah. lost his oh father. yeah Dale right. Earnhardt yeah yeah Junior and so um Junior is sharing how um there's times, especially around the time where his father, where his father died, where he didn't feel like he had it, but he did it anyway. And then after, and then here's the thing. He said, after the race, he would tell the coach and the like there that he didn't have it that day. And the coach would be like, well, that was obvious. <laughs> you know, we could all tell that you weren't here. So, so it's all just being authentic about where we are, living in the tension, being aware of our... Well, that just, maybe that's another big thing. Are we aware of even the tensions that's within within us? Mm. Are we aware of the fact when we don't mm. have it? And can we say to people, well, today I, don't, I, I ain't got it, you know? And, and and in an environment that's able to allow you to say, all right, well, we got your back. We'll figure this out. Um, especially And especially in a celebrity culture, the more and more of the celebrity that you are, the less and less you're able to be authentic and honest about where what you're actually feeling. You have to have that smile. You have to keep your edge, whatever your edge is. You have to keep your edge. And um, yeah, just being authentic about where we are, what do we feel, and just and just say, sharing those feelings and, and rolling from there. So, wow, yeah. Don't you, and, and, and it's weird too, because the competition and push to be better in some sense goes against how the culture, because you, you were saying, yeah, this idea of, uh, I, we see a, a lot of people in society are going to see what Simone did as a deficiency um, because we go to such an extreme. I mean, if you remember, and, and now, cause I dig uh, watching the tour de France because dude, I, I don't know if you've ever been on a bike seat for more than a few <laughs> minutes, you know, and those guys are they're, they're the men and women doing that tour. And even the cycling in the Olympics, you, if you haven't gotten a chance to watch it, but and they're on there for hours, right? And so, but the push to win, think about it in sports, you know, uh, the, the Tour de France was, it has been hampered with blood doping and you have baseball with the steroids and the, you know, and, and NFL and all these things and the push to win, to be the best. And we've seen that within the church. Uh, I just think about, I was watching a podcast that one of our new wine leaders uh, highlighted on the Mars Hill stuff. And that's the push towards excellence within the church, right? It seems to lead to oppression and abuse. And how do we get from where Paul says, I strove to be the best of all the apostles, you know, and, and yet not I, but by the grace of God, how do we get that mentality of pushing into excellence to be the best that God created me to be, but it's not a push towards domination, you know, I think about wrestling, uh, what we are teaching these uh, boys and girls to wrestle is domination. The way to win is that I dominate my opponent to, opponent to such a point that they're on their back and they quit, right? Well, it doesn't seem like that's loving. How do you do that, though, with a, a, a loving mentality where we teach these kids like, hey, this competition is good. Um, and I, I, I dig it. Like, sometimes I we laugh, but... Uh, because guys on a sports team tend to be a little bit different if you watch uh, and and yet you're starting to see a little bit more of that camaraderie like with the volleyball players after they I always have just been baffled because they'll miss a point or something and like the the women for the volleyball team but they'll go and they're hug and they're laughing and like I'm like <laughs> that's just not my like if a dude on my team misses a, a, a play or something we're usually like yeah, what are you doing and you know and there's a, an aggressiveness so with the competition Olympics, I dig it. But sometimes I wonder, though, even when we're 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 highlighting Simone, we're we're highlighting the stories like you were talking, uh, Jim, about the 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 runner who comes in last. Deep down inside, we're all saying, "Yeah, but I don't want to be that person. I want to be the person that's number one on the the podium, right?" Because society says, even if you're on the podium, but if you're third place, what? Of course, you're going to have some issues. You know, you're third, but you're third. You're third. You're not first. We want first. <laughs> So while we say that, though, because Jesus, I don't, Jesus never would have made it to the podium. You know, I mean, he in what was he competing for, you know, and is there a form of like, is there a, a place for this to learn that competition and pushing ourselves is a good thing? Because that could be part of the love of self that you want to push yourself, our bodies, a temple, that kind of. 
but then not letting it get to be our focus to where we lose sight of the person in front of us. How do we balance that to where I push into love of self? So I take care of myself, but that's only done in cooperation and conjunct, uh, connection with the way in which I love you in front of me, all under the, the truth of always seeking to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart. Like, how do we find that balance? Okay, I confess. I confess. Stop. You, I know you're talking to me. I was upset when the United States basketball team lost. <laughs> I did not want them to lose. I was so angry. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you're how dumb. many years has it been? And they lost. Okay, I know you're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's, you know, and like you said, I was disappointed, you know, but then here's an underdog team. Here's a team that nobody ever thought could have been, you know. But but that's not my narrative. That's not the narrative I want to hear. That's not the good news. The good right. news well, is the U.S. should have swept it. <laughs> yeah, We're, it, 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 and because I dig like we all will say like I've been watching the women's rugby and uh, or maybe it's the men's with the Fiji team. The oh, team yeah. from Fiji. Oh, my gosh. Well, because, you know, New Zealand's the, the, the New Zealand rugby black team is supposed to be the, the pin but so the underdogs, we all dig the underdogs. Right. And yet, though. Don't we want to be the one that's the number one who the underdog has to pick off, you know? Yeah. yeah. It depends who the underdog beats. That's what it's all about. Right. <laughs> right. So this is the thing. And so this is our continued press into. And so next week we're going to continue this because we're talking about this winning at all costs. You know, we have a win at all cost mentality, but the truth is, is, and this is why we're talking about the victorious in mm. the win at all cost has already been done. And that was done by Jesus. We don't need to win at all costs because Jesus did it on our behalf. He becomes sin so that we can do what? We can live, you know, freely. So what does that mean? So as we continue to press into this, we're going to continue this dialogue uh, next Friday too on, well, what does it mean to be a Christian in the 21st century? We have the goodness of the gospels. Okay, so is it okay though in a culture that pushes for the top seat on the podium, is it okay to be less than? Is it okay to be vulnerable? Is it okay to show weakness in a culture that is all about uh, up and up and up? And so we're going to do that, continue this conversation and dialogue. It's been awesome. This is Friday. We're hoping that this is the start of just a beautiful weekend for every single one of you. Uh, let your friends know that we're going to continue this conversation. You could go to our YouTube page right now uh, at other times and just hit the subscribe button right below and then hit that uh, little bell right there next to the subscribe that's notifications. And that'll let you know every time that new wine tastings, which is another video uh, program that we do with Dr. Metzger, as well as uh, we're gonna start up, we've been talking about this and as the summer starts to end and school sessions start again, we're gonna start up our new wine table talks, which is a live uh, online Facebook uh, community discussion that we'll be doing. And then also uh, new wine uncorked Fridays at 10 a.m. And we're going to continue this pressing into the kingdom so that we can be what we are created to be lovers of God and lovers of one another. And so thanks again for joining us, uh, New Wine and Cork, on behalf of Phil and Jim. I'm Matt. We'll see you on the flip side. Have a good one. <laughs>